Hey everybody, welcome back. Great to see you again. Mr. Smith here. In our last slide deck, we talked about kinetic theory and showed how in the middle to late 1800s, physicists gave a rigorous foundation to the idea of temperature. What I wanted to do is to go backwards just a little bit before that time and show you some of the discoveries that led eventually to kinetic theory. James Joule has his name on the unit of energy for a very good reason. James Joule did groundbreaking experiments around 1845, 1850 that showed that heat was a form of energy. So here's the story. At this time, the idea of potential energy was agreed on. Physicists agreed that MGH was gravitational potential energy. And what Joule did was a very simple experiment. He used this egg beater kind of apparatus to wind up masses, let them fall so that they would do work on this system. The egg beater apparatus in here did nothing except slosh water around it, agitated it. And what he showed was that the an increase of temperature, the increase of heat energy inside the water was proportional to the amount of work that he did with it. And he did experiments that were long running, consistent, and he came up with what we know as Q equals MC delta T, which is the cornerstone formula in what we call calorimetry. M is the mass of the water, delta T is the amount of temperature increase, Q is the amount of work or energy you dump into the water. C is a very interesting thing. So this chart right here is what I wanted to point towards. You're gonna notice over here the units that we really tend to use, joules per kilogram degree C. Every material has its own unique way of absorbing energy and then reflecting that energy absorption in the form of temperature. So it's really interesting. Water has an amazingly high capacity to absorb energy without warming up very much. So we'll touch on that in just a second. Before we do, one important reminder. So what we just said on the last slide was that James Joule did work, letter W, old school physics idea, on the water. That work got turned into Q, which we call thermal energy or heat. The big thing that I wanted to do here is to tie that into our last slide deck discussion about kinetic theory. And here's how I'm going to do it. Q is what we're going to call heat energy. It's the heat energy that's transferred in and out of a system. So in this case, we've got a little fire going on underneath our tea kettle. We're adding Q to this tea kettle full of water. There's a letter that we didn't use at the time. It's called letter U, and that stands for the internal energy of the entire system. So when we talked about gases, we said that the average kinetic energy of the gas molecules was 3 halves NKT. So it turns out that for systems like liquid water and solid metal, um, those systems like liquids and solids are more complicated than ideal gases are. And they don't always reflect in their temperature increase the amount of energy you gave to them the same. What is true is that the kinetic energy goes up, the temperature always goes up to some extent with those materials. Um, but the big thing you want to get out of this is U is different from Q. Uh, classic example, a cold bathtub at 10 degrees C would feel really cold to you and me. There's still an enormous amount of U of internal stored energy in a 10 degree bathtub, okay? Because that's so high above absolute zero, all right? So one last word about specific heat. Specific heat is the kind of the magic connector between energy and temperature increase. And so if you look at this table, we made the point earlier that materials like, uh, like iron, lead, silver, they have different specific heats from water. Well, a little bit about water. It wasn't until quantum mechanics was able to explain it that we had a really solid uh, basic explanation for why water's specific heat is so high. Here's why. Water has a lot of different ways it can store energy. There's a lot of freedom. Um, so H and O are bonded strongly to each other, and that H can vibrate back and forth in a number of different ways. This mode right here, where the hydrogens oscillate this way, it's called symmetric uh, vibration. There, there's a different mode, kind of like a pendulum mode, where the hydrogens vibrate back and forth. There's an, what they call an asymmetric vibrational mode, where these H's uh, vibrate in and out, out of sync with each other. And finally, the entire molecule can rotate. And all of that, in, is, in addition to the fact that water molecules can literally move, they walk around in free water like any liquid would do, but the connection between water molecules is so strong that they soak up a lot of energy 
without the temperature going up that much. So that's a little bit about specific heat. Let's go turn this into some practical examples right now and we'll show you why that works. Okay, basically there are two kinds of examples you're gonna see in this chapter, uh, or at least the first part of it. Uh, the first one is just all about that heat is a form of energy. So here's an 850 calorie um, double cheeseburger for five guys, and the question just is how high could you theoretically climb? Wow, that's a lot. So I'm gonna give you a couple of facts in this slide. Um, 850 big C calories, you may know this, but when you see it with a big C, that is equal to 850 thousand of the little c calories. Also, 850 big C calories can be converted to physics units like so. So I'm going to typically do this. I will take 850 big C calories times 4.186 kilojoules per kilocalorie. And I could have just written this with a big C cal, but I just showed you that above. And what I'm going to do is just crank that thing and turn that into joules. So what do I get for joules is 3,553 kilojoules. Is that a lot? Well, yeah, I think so. Let's go find out. If you were to climb, what would happen would be that you would take this food energy in the form of chemical energy and your muscles would do work with it assuming you're a 100% efficient person. So all of this energy would just turn into PE or MGH. And we're just gonna write down a reasonable assumption. Let's go and say that you're a 70 kilogram guy, then the height that you climb to would be, I'm gonna convert this now to scientific notation, 3.553 times 10 to the six joules uh, over 70 kgs. And we have our old friend's acceleration of gravity and what do we get is that the height that you could climb to is a pretty darn big 5075 meters um so how much energy is there in a five guys hamburger unbelievable it's <laughs> so full of so full of food energy um and if you're a 100 per, uh, efficient person you could climb this high now the first of these calorimetry examples i call level one because it's really relatively straightforward I'm going to give you a few facts up front just to make this easy. The premise of the question is just what if instead of eating that Five Guys burger, uh, what if we tried to burn it for heat and warm up our bathtub? Uh, now, believe it or not, if you burn the Five Guys hamburger for heat, you would still get uh, thermal energy equal to 3553 kilojoules. Okay, so that stands. Uh, what we need to do is, I'll, I'll just give you this for free, a 60-gallon tub is around 233 liters. The density of water is one kilogram per liter, so the mass of our water is 233 liters. And then what this really is about is trying to find the delta T in Q equals MC delta T. So what I have to do is just go to that table I talked about and look up specific heat. So um, you'll find 4186 joules per kilogram degree C. And so you can see, I'm gonna to have to be careful with my kilos or my joules when I, when I do this work, but it's not hard. So delta T is my mystery number. Uh, delta T is just gonna equal Q over MC, right? So let's go ahead and put 3553 kilojoules. And I promise to convert that when I plug it in my calculator. Mass 233, uh, and oh, I realize I caught a mistake here. It's uh, 233 kilograms. And then we've got 4186 joules per kilogram degree C. Okay, go ahead and do the work and you get delta T is a oh, laughable 3.65 degrees C. So how warm could you make your water? Well, that's a little delta question. We just started with 10 degrees. We, we made a delta T of 3.65. And so our T final is going to equal just 13.65 degrees C. So that's a lot of energy in that Five Guys Burger, but it doesn't do much to heat up a bathtub full of it because, well, first of all, it's a lot of water, right? And second of all, specific heat of water is humongous, okay? Example one. So what I call my level two question in calorimetry is a lot more involved than the first one. Um, instead of burning food, what we're going to do is just uh, warm up our bathtub the old-fashioned old way, right? So to heat up a piece of metal to scalding temperature and throw it into the tub. Uh, so this question really is called an equilibrium question, and it's so similar in some ways, logically, to what you did when you were trying to find at what temperature does the bolt and the, and the uh, ring exactly fit each other. Here's the story. If you dropped a piece of metal 
into the bathtub, what's going to happen is that Q, heat energy, is going to move from one thing to the other. So what is going to happen is that the chunk of metal, copper, is going to lose heat energy, the bathtub water is going to gain heat energy, and here's the operative idea. The Q lost is going to equal negative the Q gained. Now, in this case, you're going to see me actually, yes, worry about the negative sign. It really helps to keep things straight. Uh, trust me, uh, please. So what I'm going to do is just write down Q equals MC delta T for the copper and for the water. So it's not tricky. So what's the Q lost for the water? I have 20 grams, uh, 20, excuse me, 20 kilograms of copper metal. I go hunt down C, the specific heat of copper metal, and it's 390 joules per kilogram Kelvin, or kilogram degree C. And what's the delta T? Well, it, here's where you have to do a little bit of common sense thinking. So this is going to be TF minus 500. That's going to be my delta T for copper. Okay, so T2 minus T1. Do the same exact thing for water. So what have I got? 233 kilograms of water, specific heat of water, 4186 joules per kilogram degree C. And what's the temperature for uh, this one? Temperature change, T final minus T initial. And the T initial here is 10 degrees C. So you can see I forgot to tuck in my little negative sign. I said it was important. What that's going to have the effect of doing is an alternate way that people sometimes do this problem. Um, if you flip the delta T here, distributing the negative sign and, and doing that has exactly the same effect. So that's what you're going to see me do in this next step. I'm going to dist distribute that negative sign and, and you'll see me end up flipping these. So what happens, I'm going to simplify all this. I'm going to do it off camera and just write that down. Okay, so I've done my work. I've distributed uh, 20 times 390 into TF and 500. Uh, done the same thing on the right hand side. And uh, please feel free to check me if you want to. But what you're going to do is collect up all like terms, uh, put them and, uh, on, on where they belong, and then just go ahead and divide both sides by the uh, prefix of TF. And what I get is TF equals 13.89 degrees C. So here's the thing. Uh, amazingly, 20 kilograms, which is about 50 pounds of 500 degree copper, does just about as poorly at heating up your bathtub as burning the Five Guys Burger does. Wow. That's pretty poor, huh? Okay, so let's go check out example three and we'll be out. So I don't know if it would have dawned on you to wonder about this, but I hope it did, that in reality, if we were actually to do this experiment and drop a piece of hot metal into the water of the tub, um, that heat energy can actually go a couple places. It can, in real life, it can go to the room, which we're gonna ignore. But it's certainly going to go into the tub just as well as it goes into the bath water. Uh, and this for me is, is what I call level three. It's a calorimetry question just like the last one, but with an added term where we can't ignore the container. Now in real life, that's important. We can't actually ignore containers in calorimetry. So what you're going to see me do is set up the exact same problem, except I'm going to see Q lost is lost by the copper. And that is going to be negative of the Q gained but it's gonna be gained by two things. It's gonna be gained by the water in the bathtub and by the cast iron. So I'm gonna go write that off camera and set that up. So all we've done here, started out exactly like we had last time, copper, water, and we've just added in a term now inside of our square brackets for the tub itself. Um, so 120 kilogram tub, specific heat of cast iron, and same term, we're assuming that the cast iron tub is also at 10 degrees initially. So we're just gonna go ahead and distribute this, uh, write it out just as we did last time, and check it out at the finish line. So as you can see, we've collected our like terms, check me if you like to, uh, but we're just gonna solve this thing for TF, and we find out that TF equals 13.69 degrees C and it's amazingly uh, it's amazing this makes almost no difference so the amount of water uh, in the tub and the specific heat of water means that water soaks up almost all the heat energy and including the container here makes very little difference anyway that's the three styles of calorimetry questions as well as a conservation of energy question uh, we should have some questions we're going to talk about them in class next time take care and see you soon Bye bye